morning. So, welcome to this Innovation in Film and TV AD Zoom session. I'm Tim Calvert, I'm from the Audio Description Association, and I'll be facilitating. We have Mike Lapman, um, who is going to be hosting this session. And Michael is a filmmaker and audio describer. His short films include Awake, starring blind actors Alec Ballmer and Margot Cargill, which won the jury prize at San Francisco's Soberfest. And as an audio describer, he's worked for companies including Diverse City, The Royal Court, and the new Wolsey Theatre, as well as individual artists, including Kathy Mager. And in this workshop, which is innovative approaches to audio description in film and video, um, in 2020, he was awarded um, a Develop Your Creative Practice grant from Arts Council England to bring together the filmmaking and audio description strands of his practice, which is specifically wanted to look at innovative and integrated approaches to audio description for narrative and non-narrative film. And I will hand over now to Michael, um, who's going to lead the session. Thank you, Tim. Well, thank you all for coming. And thanks to Tim for organizing this session for me to share some of my practice. Um, I, you know, I've shared this briefly with some people and some audio description users, but it's nice to have audio description practitioners in the room. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your feedback or questions about any of uh, uh, the kind of research and practice that I've done. Um, I guess, you know, uh, I, in terms of the session, uh, it, I would like to keep it casual and have your feedback. So if you have questions at any time, you can either sort of raise your hand or put it into the chat. And uh, if it's not appropriate to kind of address the question or or comment, then we can, we can always come back to it. Um, I'll start by audio describing myself. I'm a young looking middle-aged white man, uh, clean shaven with short, uh, brown hair that's graying a bit on the sides and I'm wearing glasses and a, uh, um, a green, a dark green jumper. Um, Tim, did you want to go around? Did you want us to go around and maybe just say hi to yes. in the room? So and... if everybody wants to just quickly say hello, who they are and where they're from, if you can keep it like quite short, so it doesn't um, eat into our session. So if we start, I'll just say you, you, your name and then if you just quickly introduce yourself and sort of say where you're from. So if we start with Di. Hello, I'm a mature woman with uh, gray hair and glasses and a stripy t-shirt and a warm cardigan. And where are you from, Di? I'm in Brighton, I'm okay. Brighton in the UK. <laughs> And we'll go over to Lorna now. Hello, Lorna. Hi, I'm Lorna. Um, I'm a youngish white woman with dark brown hair tied up and glasses. Um, I'm based in Norwich and I've just done an audiovisual translation master's, so this is particularly interesting to me, Michael. Excellent. Thank you, Lorna. And Olga next. Hello, Olga. It's great to have you with us. Um, hello. Um, I'm sort of middle-aged uh, uh, white woman with... Um, uh, shoulder length brown hair. Uh, I um, am a researcher. I've just started my PhD in um, audio description and specifically personalization, ways, ways to personalize, personalize audio description uh, with the University of Surrey. And um, I'm currently in Liverpool. Excellent. Thank you, Olga. Alice next. Hello, Alice. Hi, um, I'm Alice. I'm based up in Bradford and uh, I'm an audio describer and sound designer. Um, I'm in my 50s. I have grey, curly hair and glasses. Excellent. Thank you, Alice. Louise next. Hello, Louise. Hi, I'm Louise. I'm from Northumberland. Uh, I work in the theatres in Newcastle doing audio description and I also work at the Baltic um, doing audio description, doing scripts for them. That's a uh, modern, modern art. <laughs> um, 
and I'm well, middle-aged with long brown hair and yes, let's make fun. Okay, thank you, Louise and Anne next. Hello, Anne. Sorry, I'm a techn <laughs> technological person. Um, hi, everyone. Lovely to see you. Hello, Michael. Lovely to see you again. Michael and I have worked together oh, for many, many years. Um, I've been audio describing since 1990, so I'm very old. I've got grey <laughs> hair and I run my inside. Excellent. Um, um, a white, although at the moment I'm quite a pink person because there's sun coming through the window. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Anne. Next, Ruth. Hello, Ruth. Are you there, Ruth? I think we've lost Ruth briefly. Mm -hmm. So we'll go on to Claire. Hello, Claire. Oh, hello. Uh, yes, I, I'm Claire LeMay. I'm a freelance audio describer, a middle aged white woman, and I'm currently in France. Excellent. Well, great to have you here, Claire. And next up is Jane. Hello, Jane. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm another middle-aged white woman with long, dark hair, <laughs> brown hair. Um, I am also a freelance audio describer um, for film and TV. And I am also a filmmaker as well. So this is particularly interesting to me. Um, and I have just made a film... Um, integrating audio description uh, into the into the script and the filmmaking process so I'm, I'm really excited to to hit m learn more about Michael's work. Excellent great to have you with us over to the states now in St Louis and Megan. Hey uh, yes I'm also a middle-aged white woman but I happen to today have blue hair because I partied it up with Kevin Smith last week um, at Clerks 3. So um, I am also an audio describer in the States. Yeah, thanks. Excellent. Mark's next. Hello, Mark's. Are you there, Mark's? We'll come back. We'll go on to Jenny. Hello, Jenny. Hi guys, um, I'm Jenny. I am currently making, uh, buttering a piece of toast, hence why I'm not on camera, um, squeezing this into a little lunch break. Lovely to be here. I think I currently look like a white blob on a black background, but I'm usually um, another white woman who is kind of approaching middle age. <laughs> Excellent, great to have you with us, Jenny. Next, Trish. Hi everybody. Um, again, sorry, I can't keep the video on all the time on this, but I'm Trish. Um, I'm 50 year old white woman uh, with long brown hair, funnily enough. Um, I'm an audio describer who mainly deals with um, digital now and so describing um, for streaming films and series. Um, and I'm based in Oxford. Excellent. Thank you, Trish. We'll go back to Marks. Are you there, Marks? Or Mark? Hello, Mark. I think you want mute. No. We'll go to Elaine then. Elaine. Hey, everybody. Hello, um, Elaine. Hey, yeah. Uh, my name's Elaine. Um, I'm a black woman in my thirties. I'm based in kind of Birmingham slash London, the UK. And I'm also an audio describer, so I do film and TV. Excellent. And we'll try one more time for Mark. Hello, Mark. Must be having a few issues. So we'll hand back over to you then, Michael. Great, thank you. Well, that's really exciting to hear all of your expertise and areas of interest. And I hope that you'll feed back and uh, give me some impressions and we can have a, a, a nice discussion. Uh, I'm going to do a bit of a presentation. I'll show some of my work and then we're leaving. Uh, hopefully we'll have some, a, a good amount of time at the end for some discussion or questions or anything that it's provoked. So the basis of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, at the beginning of last year, I was awarded um, a Develop Your Creative Practice grant uh, from the Arts Council of England. Uh, to look at the intersection of my film filmmaking 
and audio description practices. Uh, and uh, is, uh, Develop Your Creative Practice is really a process-driven grant. It's, it's kind of fantastic and they're ongoing. So you, I would encourage people to look into them. It's kind of a chance to reevaluate your practice and try things out and experiment. It's not supposed to be product-driven, but being a product-driven person, I ended up creating some product. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I wanted to look, I, you know, as a filmmaker, I've always been uh, involved in accessible practice. Uh, a lot of my work has been working with deaf and disabled actors and crew, and I've always looked at uh, accessible practice and accessible distribution in my filmmaking process. Uh, and I'm also an audio describer and access manager. I worked at Gray Eye for many years and uh, I, and I started getting into audio description um, and have worked in audio description in theater and especially in, in film, a, a little less in theater, more in film and visual arts. And the funny thing was when I sort of was contemplating it. So I, my filmmaking practice is sort of divided between some narrative short films which I've done, which are sort of conventional films, but I also do some experimental non-narrative films that are like collages of images. And I've always tried to audio describe my work, but when I went back and I looked at the, the ways that I had audio described my work, I realized or that it was pretty conventional in my approaches that I had taken to it. And that was fine, I think, uh, for the narrative work, but some of the non-narrative work and more experimental collage type work, I really thought there was like almost a dis disjunct between the way I was describing it and the film itself. So you had these kind of experimental films with very objective or traditional description. And I thought that, you know, especially because I'm I'm the artist and I'm the one, I didn't have to contend with asking somebody's permission to be experimental with the audio description. It's my own work. So I kind of was a bit baffled of why I had not taken a more kind of interesting approach. So that's what I applied to do is really to kind of look at uh, more innovative approaches to audio description for narrative and non-narrative film. And the way that I structured the grant and I, really grateful that I got it. It was a fantastic uh, opportunity. The way that I structured it was to kind of divide it up into three parts. In the first part, I wanted to research what people are doing out there. What are the innovative approaches that people are already taking? What are the experimental approaches? Who had done some interesting work? And what strategies were there? So, you know, I'm not inventing the, I'm not inventing the wheel. There's people who are already working, doing interesting things. For the second part, I wanted to go back to two of my uh, shorts, experimental shorts, and redo the audio description using some creative tools that came out of the research. So how could I create an audio description track or audio description uh, audio that was more interesting than what I had originally created? And then finally, I wanted to challenge myself to create a new piece, or at least to start creating a new piece that had integrated audio description in the piece, but mix narrative and abstract work or narrative and experimental work and bringing a kind of interesting audio description approach right from the beginning to, to that process. Uh, so that's what I did. Um, the first stage of it was a research stage. And um, so I, I, I contacted a lot of different people who are working in the field. I had two sort of mentors or uh, or uh, uh, like coaches or guides in this work. One was uh, Alex Bulmer, who's a blind uh, writer, filmmaker, and a good friend of mine. And Alex was sort of guiding the process around uh, researching and constructing the project and giving me feedback along the way. And then it, it sort of all this work coincided with a, a kind of push on the part of Vocalize to do sort of workshops. I think they had gotten some funding to to outreach. And so they had a mentorship program and Louise Fryer, who's an audio describer and has written fantastic books and research, she came on as my mentors uh, uh, through a vocalized program. So both of them guided me sort of in my approach and guided me along the way. And Louise introduced me to a few people that became really key in these research uh, aspects of it. 
So some of the first people I talked to were Ben Shirley, who's at the University of Salford, and uh, Pablo Romero Fresco at the University of Roehampton. And you might know uh, these people, they're kind of in an academic setting. They're looking into uh, sort of approaches to audio description, what are cutting edge approaches, and they've done experimentation and research and created some tools, which I found really, really fascinating. Uh, one, I'm going to keep sharing my screen and then uh, switch back and forth from that. One of the projects that Ben Shirley worked on was uh, there was fun. They they approached one episode of Casualty and they created uh, both Ben and uh, Pablo were really interested in the idea of um, choice with audio description. So a lot of what they worked on was a kind of, uh, as I understand it, it was to give the, the audience, the audio description uh, listener, a choice between different sort of objects, what they call objects, in the audio description soundtrack. So for instance, you have the dialogue, you have the background sound, and you have the audio describer's description. And obviously different people respond you know, to one, the mix of these in a usual setting is really set. Usually in audio description track for, for video, you're hearing uh, the prominence of the audio describer's voice and the dialogue goes to the background and the uh, audio, the soundscape goes to the background. But they created a kind of a uh, 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 slider where the viewer could uh, I don't know if anybody's experienced it, but they created a slider where the a viewer could decide how much, you know, I want more ambient sound and I want the audio describer's voice to be quieter, or I want the dialogue to be prominent. I don't care about the background sound and, you know, the audio describer's voice somewhere in the middle. So uh, that was really interesting to me. I'm just, you can, if you search for casualty audio description, I'm showing you a page here, which is sort of, uh, you can't actually experience this version as far as I know with the slider, but this page tells you a bit about the project. And if you're interested, you could follow that up. What fascinated me, there were a couple of things that really fascinated me about that, uh, that, that approach and that research uh, was the idea of choice. I think, you know, the idea of giving, because I was always trying to think, okay, you know, if I created a sort of innovative approach to my videos or an experimental or poetic approach to the audio description, then I know somebody's going to come along and say, just give me the objective description or they'll miss that, right? Every, every, I'm sure you've all experienced as audio describer, everybody has a different opinion on what works for them. And people have different hearing. The way people hear things is different. So the idea of options and putting the control for the user, that was fascinating to me. On the other hand, I think what was a little bit intimidating to me was to look at this, you know, how, how research intensive this was and how technology intensive this was. In my own practice as a filmmaker, I've always been sort of DIY, do it yourself and relied on DIY tools. And I encourage other people to, to do that too. Like, you know, that there are ways to create access to your work in a a cheap and effective way that you didn't have to rely on complicated tools. So when I saw something like this, I thought, this is great. I love the idea of options. But uh, on the other hand, um, uh, how can I bring this into my work? You know, I can bring the principle, but I don't have access to this technology. Another fantastic uh, technology that Ben Shirley had worked on, they did a radio uh, and I'm going to try and explain this. So uh, if, if my explanation isn't clear, just let me know. But what they did was they worked with BBC Radio. They created a, a radio piece called Voss Talk. I'm going to put that in the chat. Voss Talk. And it's sort of a sci-fi about the Russian space program and everything. What they did was create this technology that you can... Um, attach as many different devices to the program. So you link your devices to the program and you place them around the room. And so let's say I did it with my laptop, 
my phone and my iPad. And each one of them is playing a slightly different soundtrack. So let's say my laptop would be connected to the um, to the dialogue. My uh, my uh, phone would be connected to the audio effect or you could have stereo audio effects with two different phones. Again, this was, I mean, it was actually surprisingly easy to kind of connect and to, to link to this technology. And to me, that was a fantastic spatial way of getting different soundtracks to something, uh, to one, uh, different soundtracks or alternate soundtracks to one program. And, you know, organizing it spatially. So you put your phone to the left and your iPad to the right, you get a stereo thing. And if you prefer, you know, louder sound effects, you move towards your, potentially you can move towards your phone. If you prefer more dialogue, you can move towards your, your iPad. So again, there was this, uh, well, <laughs> this is going to be a running theme. Again, there was this fantastic uh, opportunity for choice and for the user to control the way they were receiving that. But again, it was, although, you know, I, I didn't really follow, I ended up not really following it up, but Ben gave me permission, you know, through the internet to have access to this technology. I found it a little complicated, you know, I didn't find it complicated to use, but I found it complicated, uh, you know, as a listener, but as a creator, I found it a little bit complicated to access, but I want to go back and explore that technology because, you know, they're not being possessive about the technology. They're allowing artists and other people to use it. But uh, I think it would take an investment to be able to use that. But again, I thought, okay, this is a complicated technology. How can I you know, I love the idea of it. How can I bring this idea of options and spatial different soundtracks in different spaces? How can I bring that into my own work? So again, if you, uh, I, I, I'm not going to show you the link, but you can, um, you can have a look. Uh, if you look up Vostok BBC, I think you'll find the project. And then the third project that really made a big impression on me was, and some of you might know about this, is the enhanced description project through uh, that's being done through the University of uh, uh, York. And uh, I, it's Mariana Lopez is spearheading that, who you might know. Uh, again, it's coming out of a, uh, I think it's coming out of a sound design program, but uh, uh, Mariana and her team are really uh, interested in looking at alternative approaches to audio description. It's a project called Enhancing Audio Description. They've done part one and they're currently doing part two. Um, enhancing audio description, the first part, and I should say that they are very, uh, they're very uh, diligent about at all stages having feedback from the blind and partially sighted community. So it's not theoretical, they actually do practical, uh, practical work, and then they get feedback, and then they reinvent it and, and tweak it. And so it's been a really interesting project to follow. So enhancing audio description, I think after through all their research, uh, they ended up sort of re or creating new audio description on a, on a short film called Pearl, which you can have a look at online. And Pearl is a little bit, it's almost like a horror film or it's not that scary, but it's, a, it's a, in that genre. And their key findings, they came up with three key strategies to enhance audio description, all of which are really fascinating. One is in, you know, which is fairly obvious, enhanced audio in your film. So let the audio, letting the audio uh, do the work. You know, some, you know, when a character comes in a room and shuts the door and uh, and, uh, you know, how much of those sound effects, how, how can you finesse your soundtrack or enhance your soundtrack to convey information, which filmmakers sometimes might not think as much about, uh, or, you know, just sort of short shrift their soundtrack a little bit. The second was the use of binaural sound. So recording binaural sound, which gives a spatial orientation. So, you know, you don't have to say somebody comes in from the left when you can hear that they're coming in from the left. And Pearl, if you listen with headphones, is it, there's a lot of moments in Pearl that is beautifully done where uh, where uh, you're getting a, 
a visual impression just because the sound is so directional. And then the third um, innovation or the third uh, strategy that they looked at was what they call the eye voice. So having the audio description, and of, of course, I think a lot of us are familiar about this, but maybe don't get as much of a chance to use it, having a subjective audio description. So they wrote the audio description from the point of view of one of the characters in the film, which in this case, I think works really strongly and replaces a lot of the need for traditional audio description. It also brings you to a place where, you know, you're not describing, let's say, the character's facial expression, but you are hearing it in the voice of the audio describer. It's not, we all know, it's not always an appropriate way to go, but it, looking at their work, it was an incredibly a powerful tool. And it was one that I thought really is pertinent to my work, because as the filmmaker, you know, we're always trying to involve the creative team where we can into our work, into our audio description and trying to do audio description at an early stage. But again, uh, because I'm the filmmaker, I thought I had a lot of leeway to do this in my own work. And I really thought, well, why haven't I done this before? Um, so those were really the key. Uh, there were other people that I consulted with, Chloe Clark, but uh, other people whose work I'm interested in were more theater-based. Theater uh, Chloe Clark, who's uh, working out of Wales and had done sort of integrated audio description in her in her uh, theater work, and uh, Maria Oshadi, who's always been experimental with audio description around her work with Extant Theater. So there were a lot of, and Grey Eye, where I worked. I mean, Jenny Seeley always was like having the audio description as one of the characters, the audio describer as one of the characters on stage. Uh, in Reasons to be Cheerful, he was talking in a phone booth that was on stage. It was Pickles Norman who was doing it. So I thought there were a lot of inventive strategies on uh, that had been used uh, even in mainstream theater or in more experimental theater, but I was stretched to kind of find uh, more experimental strategies for film and video. And these are some of the ones that I found. Does anybody have any questions? That was sort of the research phase. Does anybody have questions or comments on that so far? Okay, uh, well, feel free, we can come back to that. So then uh, the next stage, I wanted to go back and I wanted to look at the audio description of two short films that I had done, which are, uh, I wouldn't say they're experimental, but they're like collage films, heavily visual, and I had described them in a, a pretty traditional way. And I wanted to see if the research had generated any interesting ideas um, to recreate the audio description in a, a more almost a more effective way because, you know, there was a bit of a, like I said, there was a bit of a, 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 a disjunct between, between the style of the film and the style of the audio description. So, um, and I knew that I needed to work with a, a sound designer or I really wanted to work with a sound designer and that was part of the, the, the project. So I worked for, on these two films, I worked with a sound designer called Callum Perrin and he's a composer and a sound artist. Uh, I'll put his name again. And he does some beautiful work on BBC, for BBC Radio. Callum Perrin, oops, Callum Perrin. He does some beautiful soundscape and very sound evocative works. And I had met him through another project and uh, he really helped me. It was great to have somebody to bounce off of, but also when I had an idea of something to do, he really uh, had the skills to, to do that. So what I'd like to do now, I'll show you the two films I worked on. I'm gonna show you a bit, the first one is called Flow 2. And uh, you'll see what it is, but it was made uh, in a year where I was traveling a lot and I wanted to sort of document some of the visual, you know, some of the visual and audio stuff that I was, or place, really places and environment that I had been to. And I also was playing with sort of rhythm in editing. So some of the, you know, I wanted to create a rhythm through the editing of the clips. So I'm gonna show you uh, a little bit of it of this film that as I originally, with the original audio description, so this is the original traditional audio description of the film. 
So if you have headphones, now's a good time to use them. Um, this is that. Oops, let me just find the film. So this is Flow 2 with the original AD. Quick cuts, the spinning propeller out the window of an airplane. A swan swims on an urban canal. Battered fishing boats rest on a placid river under a cloudy sky. The white hulls gleam in the setting sun. View from a vehicle of an urban street in Jogjakarta, Indonesia. Market stalls, passers-by. A single sailboat, its sail lowered, putters along the placid river. The pale pink and blue sky reflects in the water. Surf on sand around submerged rocks. Traveling across a steel truss bridge. The swan waiting in the reflection of a tower block. A rocky shore beneath a mountain range. So, uh, as you can see, that's a fairly traditional audio description. It's a bit of a challenge to create the mood of the film because, um, I'm going to stop sharing, a bit of a challenge to create the mood of the film because it takes, so, you know, the, the some of the cuts are quick and by the time you're finished, you know, describing this very peaceful uh, scene of boats on water, you're moving to the next clip and the audience doesn't really have a chance, or the AD audience doesn't really have a chance to absorb the the um, the uh, peacefulness of the scene. So I wanted to try. I, I was looking at different tactics to uh, to uh, audio describe the film, and I, I sort of put everything on the table. And um, we came up with working with Callum. We came up with a, you know, we couldn't use all of the strategies, but working with Callum, I came up with a few different strategies to try out on this. So I'll show you the version that has uh, enhanced, hang on. I'll show you the version now that has uh, the enhancements we made to the audio description tracks. And so you can have a listen to it. It's, how long is it? It's about, it's about five minutes long. And I think we'll play it all the way through just so you get a sense of what the work is like. black and white striped propeller spins. A swan swims on an urban canal. Rest. Battered fishing boats rest on a placid river under a cloudy sky. Their white hulls gleam in the setting sun. Glow. View from a moving vehicle of an urban street at night. Market stalls, passers-by. A single sailboat, its sail lowered, glides along the placid river. The water still surface mirrors the pale pink and blue sky. Float. Surf swirls around rocks submerged in a sandy shore. Cars travel along a steel truss bridge. The swan wades in the reflection of a tower block, dips its beak in the water. Dip. Boulders bulge in the sand and surf under a craggy, distant mountain range. Roll. Spin. Out the window of a flying plane, the striped propeller spins. Chill. From a moving vehicle, night in the city. People milling about and stopping in groups to chat. chat. Women wearing headscarves gaze at their mobiles. A scooter passes. Potted trees, fences, street lamps. Another woman pauses with an infant slung around her chest. Shine. The fishing boats float on the river in the luminous sunset. Drift. Shine. 
Seen from a moving train, a cluster of concrete nuclear reactors recedes in the setting sun. Three pigeons rest on a ledge overlooking a stony riverbank, still except for twitching heads. Holes. The speckled one on the left wanders out of the corner of the frame. The view rises to reveal a steel boy floating on the river and a motorboat passing along the far shore. Pass. Flutter. A bird flies past, then another, and then another, another, and then another. strewn bank close to us, a figure in fluorescent clothes works beside a caterpillar crane. Traverse. A flat barge passes loaded with shipping containers. The Thames overlooked by St. Paul's Cathedral, Moscow Kremlin at night. A woman floats on a surfboard, view of a river from under a bridge. Yeah. Cars whiz in both directions along a sunken motorway. High-rise building on an urban street with overground train passing, cars passing, people passing. A construction crane lifts a container onto the roof. View of a muddy river from the back of a moving boat. A white swan ducks its loopy neck into the water. Another river at low tide rushes over exposed sandbanks reflecting the muted sunlight. Run. Drain. The view rises to reveal surrounding banks and a bridge in the distance. From above, a view of the same Clifton Suspension Bridge built into the surrounding rock and tree-covered cliffs high above the Avon River. Tiny cars travel in both directions across the stretch of suspended roadway. Suspension. Passage. Down below again, the Russian River. Glide. View from another moving boat. On the banks, gnarled leafy trees and tiny white birds resting along the shore. Flat. A flickering sea at sunset seen from a passing vehicle. Rolling tide at sunset. A working boat chugs along the ink black river. Rocks submerged in sand at the edge of the sea as gentle waves roll in and out. Sleep. Title Flow 2, Machtman, 2020-2022. Sound design, Callum Perrin. Supported using public funding by Arts Council England Lottery Funded. So, uh, that one, as you can see, I mean, I had an original audio description and I used most of the text. Of course, it was, you know, looking back, it, I refined the text somewhat, but uh, I, I didn't, I chose to work with uh, the original audio description and just uh, augment it or enhance it. Some of the, I'm curious to get your impressions, but so I'll just tell you some of the techniques that we used. So first of all, uh, I think most importantly, when I went back, I realized the sound and the audio, which had been recorded sort of in situ, was not that good always. So when I had a, let's say, the, a rushing river, sometimes the river rushing sound wasn't as good as it could be, or I would have wind noise. And I really had to ask myself, why didn't you fix these things before? And there was no reason you can't go and get kind of a stock rushing river sound. It may sound like cheating, but it's actually more effective for audio description users and tells you so much about the place. So I went back and with Callum, we sort of enhanced we took away a lot of the music score, which was quite repetitive, and we enhanced the actual ambient audio quite a bit. 
Second thing we did was we played with, and I, I hope you could hear it, we played with uh, uh, some of the filtering of, of my voice as the audio describer. So sometimes it sounds like it's coming through a tannoy. We didn't re-record it so that it's binaural, but we did. he did play with kind of the direction. So sometimes like where the boat is passing, it, it the sound starts here and gradually moves across uh, uh, of the tannoy voice. And there were other filtering effects, you know, that maybe sound more peaceful on the river or, it, it, you know, the sort of world's your oyster in terms of controlling. Of course, you could get a different voice, but just working with my limiting to my voice, uh, you could you could enhance all kinds of different fil ways through filtering and through sound adjustments. You could change that. And obviously, I was hoping that, you know, it would be appropriate for the clip and give it a, a sense of that. What's hard to convey in this for somebody who's not who's non sighted is that you know you're seeing a succession of clips. So if the tone if the tone or the quality of the sound changes from one clip to the next, that immediately signals that you know we're on a different clip. We did. Uh, I have to listen closer, and we did also. Callum created a pulse that happens rather than saying scene cut or scene change or new clip on each one. He created a pulse when the scene changes. Now, when I'm listening to it on my headphones today, I don't really hear that, and it might be just be I've chosen the wrong. I haven't listened in a little while. I might have chosen the wrong mix of it for the Vimeo clip, but that was definitely one of our strategies, this nice kind of low, almost um, subliminal pulse where you change the scene. And then finally, I wanted to, you know, thinking about poetic description, I wanted to think, I wanted to create something that gave the texture of the clip, you know, rather than just a, a very talky description, a boat going on. I wanted to use those single words at times like calm or rest or float that I thought would give uh, give something uh, overall what this scene, a little bit what it means to me as the creator, but also what the feeling or the texture of is, which maybe is, you know, maybe you don't get as much from the, from the, uh, objective audio description. So that was something that we put in and also each of those has its own filter. So I'm curious to hear if anybody has any comments of what you think of that. Is it, you know, would you think by the end of it, is the soundtrack overloaded or do you like the kind of, uh, do you like some of the strategies that you heard? If anybody has any feedback. Hello, it's Ruth James here. Just to say, I thought the soundtrack was amazing on the second version. It was just made all the difference. Just being able to hear the sea and then the, the, the river and the and the cars, so much better, definitely. Good oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Anne? Oh, sorry, who's next? Uh, Jane? Jane, hi. Um, yeah, I really uh, loved the, uh, the, the one word with the text, the flow, the rest, the calm. Um, I thought it was lovely the way it intersected with the, with your voice, you know, your voiced AD. Uh, it kind of reminded me a bit of the way we remember films or or you remember a journey, you know, you kind of remember the, the essence of that place that you were in. Um, and I thought that came across really well. It was lovely. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think thinking of memory in relation to this. Anne? Um. Hi, Michael. Um, yep, I I was listening to it without looking at it this time. When I, I listened to it before, when we had our conversation, I was watching the film at the same time, but I was just listening. And I really noticed the enhanced sound this time. Um, and I just, I love the, the one word drop-ins as well. It's just poetry and it says so much. And it's a great, sort of guideline for us all, always thinking less is more. Um, but the, the combination of that and then the slightly fuller descriptions, I think worked really well. And it worked for me not looking at it too. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, again, it would be interesting to 
offer listeners the choice so you could hear it maybe just with the little one words and the ambient sound without the you know the other description if somebody wanted to experience the film that way but certainly enhancing the um enhancing the audio track was something that I went back and I thought well in any filmmaking I'm going to do in the future I I I mean the audio is so evocative and I, I was sort of kicking myself like why didn't I do this before I was sort of working on collaging and putting them together but I never took the time and so I think that's really influenced my filmmaking practice as much as my audio description practice. Hi Michael um I did just wonder whether sometimes I found the isolated words on their own more easy to integrate into my understanding of what was going on when they occurred after the audio description there was some context and sometimes before the audio description I wondered if that might kind of increase the cognitive load a little bit of trying to work out what that isolated word was and how it related to what was coming. Yeah I mean I think that's there's truth to that. I didn't want it to get in too much of a kind of uh, pattern or formula that the kind of the word I, I sort of wanted it to be more interactive but I do recognize what you're saying but I didn't want it to get to be like description word description word I thought that would get a bit boring so thank you for your comments and we can come back at the end to these um the next so then I had another film that was is shorter and uh, I'll play it for you. Um, yeah, it's quite short. I'm, I think I'll play it all the way through because it's only two minutes. Or, oh. And it's interesting to see the difference between these. Wait. So let me, this is an experiment. This is a film called Flying and Floating. Split screen. On the left. Against an orange sky, a silhouetted figure stands on a paddleboard, paddling across the sea's rippled surface. Title, Flying and Floating. On the right. Seen out a plane window, the sideways view of a jet engine illuminated against the night sky. A white aluminium cylinder with a yellow stripe along its lower edge. Left. Seagulls fly past one by one. Right. Streaks of tiny light quickly passing. The engine bumps and rocks as the plane lands. Left. Seen from high above, jagged mountain peaks topped in snow. Right. A burnt-out cast-iron pavilion set in the sea, silhouetted against a pastel sky. A murmuration of starlings swirls around the top in constantly changing patterns, clustering and unclustering. Right. The jet engine judders along the runway, passing streaks of tiny white and blue lights. Left. The paddler glides towards the sparkling wake created by the setting sun's reflection on the water. The sun, a hot white disk surrounded by a glowing yellow aura, hovers over the water's rippled surface, disrupted by gently rolling waves. Seagulls sail across the sky, flapping V-shapes. Left. Sunlight flares in the camera lens, creating a bobbing, pinky-orange glare that echoes the circular shape of the sun. Right. A skinny black dog waits on a field of snow, wagging its tail. A ball is thrown past it, and it runs off into the distance, leaps to catch the ball in the air, then runs back towards us with the ball in its mouth. It chomps the ball, then drops it, looking up expectantly. The fluorescent yellow tennis ball rests on the packed snow. 
A hand picks up the ball and pitches it once again, and again the dog runs off across the field, retrieves the ball, romps back towards us, and runs out the bottom of the frame, its tail wagging. Left. The paddler paddles. Title, Mactman 2015. Okay, so that was the first version. I particularly wanted to work with this film because um, I was curious to, to work with a split screen. So often I use that as a tactic in my filmmaking and to audio describe that uh, can be challenging. And the other thing that really inspired me was a Pablo Romero Fresco, who teaches at the University of Roehampton, showed me a clip of a film that one of his students had done. Now she had... Um, she had uh, tried to audio describe a little excerpt from Fantasia. Do people know the Walt Disney musical? It's a classic and it's the score. It's sort of cartoons with a score of classical music. And she had taken the strategy to, she sang the audio description in time with the classical music, which I thought was just a brilliant. And, you know, it's a Walt Disney movie. So uh, I was inspired by that. So together working with, um, with Callum, we came up with uh, a second version of this film, Flying and Floating, and I'll show that to you now. Title, Flying and Floating. Look out the window, the jet engine's humming. We're coming in for a landing. Lights twinkle past, lights twinkle past. Look out the window, the jet engine thumps. We've come in for a landing. Lights twinkle past, lights twinkle past. Circle over the surface of the sea. He paddles and paddles in the sunset orange. I'm a burnt out derelict pavilion. You could say I've seen better days But with the waves ticking my cast iron poles And murmurations of starlings swirling around my rusty structure I don't feel so nervous Standing on the surfboard On the surface of the sea Sunset orange Sun sings Like a glowing orb Into the horizon Lights of the ripples Golden heavens Lights twinkle past Look out the window The jet engine thumps We've come in for a landing. Lights twinkle past, lights twinkle past. In winter, I used to take my little black dog Alma to the snow covered field in the park and throw a yellow tennis ball. She would fly like the wind, her little black legs barely touching the ground, and jump up to catch it. Then she'd run back to where I was standing and chomp it a few times and drop it. There was no way to stop this. Alma never got tired. Mactman 2015-2022. Sound design Callum Perrin. Supported using public funding by Arts Council England Lottery Funded. So that was my playful approach to uh, that film. And uh, it was a really interesting experience to work on it. I, I thought, um, again, curious to hear feedback. I thought that something about bringing the music into the voice and singing, although it sounds quite outlandish, it really allowed me to 
uh, what I was aiming for was like a sense through the melody to uh, to convey the placidness of, let's say, that paddle border on the thing, or th to convey through the through the way I was phrasing it, the uh, jumpiness of the dog. So I loved working on that. Of course, it's you know. <laughs> You have to be the filmmaker to to let yourself do that, but I kind of I think it really opens it up. Uh, just saying, I you know I can imagine going to uh, going to a filmmaker and saying I want to sing the audio description. They might not always be receptive, but uh, and again I, I I sort of felt like at the end of it I had a more even even though it's an audio description tool I prefer the this version of the film to the non audio described version now because I think it's you know there's there's more to it and there's more of me in the film. Does anybody have any comments or questions about that that process or that film. You're stunned. You're stunned. Um, <laughs> I think um, the one thing I'll say about that is it had a very new age feel. It was like it was like almost listening to a Mike Oldfield track, but it also gave you the almost idea of what can be done in audio description with song and with integrated soundtracks. Um, and it's something that I've not thought about before. But even though it was quite an odd experience, it worked. <laughs> um, and I don't think I would want it any other way. You well, know, because you. the first 20 seconds, I was thinking, this is really bizarre. It, it, it's like really strange. But it fitted in with all of the images that were on screen. And it kind of, it was like a bit like a symbiosis and they actually worked in harmony with each other. Well, thanks, yeah, that's good to hear. I mean, the other thing in that film, which I didn't mention is that it's, you know, the split screen strategy of having, you know, one sound coming from the left and one from the right, you know, uh, reflecting what's on screen meant that you could have almost a blend of that. And I'm sure some people might find that distracting, but I think it really gives a much stronger sense that two things, you know, equivalent to the visual sense of two things happening at once and the relation of the images to each other, which if you're just going on the left this and on the right that, you don't get the sense of how they resonate with each other. So, or when they stop and start necessarily. So that became a really uh, great tool, uh, which obviously is more, you can hear it more in the, in the, if you're using headphones, I would love to, I haven't had the opportunity to really set it up in a room with speakers, uh, but I would love to do that in like a gallery space and have, you know, have that set up so you could, you know, without headphones that you could really feel them coming from different sides. That'd be amazing. I think Jenny has a hand up. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Michael. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. That was that was really interesting and um I, I didn't know you could sing I don't know if you <laughs> normally call yourself a singer but it's quite brave to um to do that whether you see yourself as a singer or not actually because either way you know it could be met with some surprise um yeah what I really liked about it was what you just mentioned this idea of being able to overlap things because it's you know if we're just speaking we would never overlap two audio description tracks but somehow with the music that allowed it and I liked how it pulled the focus sort of it, I felt like my focus drifted from one thing to the next in very much the same way as it would if I was just watching the film um, I was actually listening to it while doing the washing up so it was um, quite nice to see how that worked um, yeah I really felt that kind of echoed the way in which with a split screen film that is non-narrative your kind of your focus is 
does kind of drift between the different parts of it and isn't necessarily being directed in a really precise way. So I thought that was interesting. Um, I did have a little question, and this is this might be for later because it kind of applies to both your films. Um, going back to what you said earlier on about being a DIY person usually and then obviously you've made these two films where you um have worked with a sound designer and done some quite interesting stuff with sound so I'd be really interested to know to what extent you feel um you know other people could learn to do some stuff with sound um without necessarily always needing to pull in a sound designer which then becomes the kind of the limiting factor in in some projects especially if you want to just have a play with something yeah I think that's a really good question I mean um, my sort of approach to DIY is always to look at things and think how can I do this myself so I think that would apply I mean in sort of editing programs you often have like either more you know I, I'm not a qualified sound designer and so when you start to get into kind of uh high pass and low pass or whatever all those kind of technical terms of adjusting the sound I'm a bit lost but you can there are aspects of some programs where you can sort of say sound cathedral sound or it's actually like the name of a filter or small closet sound and you can have a play with those obviously uh you can you know, a DIY approach, you can make funny voices yourself or use different registers of your own voice or call in different people diff and, and access different people to voices. Something like panning from left to right is really easy to do yourself. So I think it's a bit mixed. I think it's about trying to, you know, there's the side of it, which is what do you want? And then what are what 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 tools do you have to try and achieve that uh, vision of what you want? But certainly working with a sound designer was, it really opened up a, a, a whole area. I mean, also just getting the feedback from him of, you know, um, I think, it, which one was it? It was the first one, flow. So I have this, in the initial one, I have this musical phrase that just repeats and repeats and repeats. And he's, you know, he's a sound designer. So he said, well, let's not repeat the whole musical phrase, but let's take one, you know, let's just take the string section or one section of it and, you know, just use that here. And then let's use the percussion section of it somewhere else. So certainly having that kind of expertise is, is really, it's both really exciting and enhances what you can do, but it also makes you aware of what, how you, what, what you can do in your role. So I, that's a bit long winded, but I think, you know, just looking at trying to do a basic sound course in filtering voices, how or and just playing around with your audio programs, you can find a lot just increasing reverberation. I mean, you know, if you have three different types styles of audio description, one is no, you can make one no reverberation, one big reverberation, one somewhere in the middle. And right away you have three things that distinguish, you know, three separate Th uh, sounds that are distinguished from another and then you just place one to the left and one to the right and then you you know you're expanding expanding multiplying the options so um and yeah thanks michael i just wanted to say um i think one of the tools that we have at our disposal which really comes through if you sing it um, is the how much we can vary the rhythm and the pace. So that's whether we're speaking or singing. Um, and we can do that all the time with no extra equipment or even a sound designer. But it just, it, using the music really illustrates that. But even without the, even without the, the music, um, you you can do that the the flock of the birds as opposed to the punchiness of something so i get, just thought that brought it home really strongly as well thanks yeah you don't have to go out to all out singing but you can use some of the principles of singing in your delivery which maybe is we underuse um i should just say that you know i through the whole process i kept on going back to people audio description uh, users and I kept uh, I was really keen to get feedback on everything I was doing and uh, 
I have to say that the feedback was really varied. So uh, again, that gave me sort of really made me think about options and and wishing for ways that I could give different options, different or or how somebody could control it themselves. Because you know those one let's say uh, what would be an example. So the the some people loved that final film, the enhanced soundtrack with with. Uh, with uh, serves for flying and floating and thought that it was, uh, you know, a work in itself and they were ha really happy to have access to it. And I had another person who's blind say to me, well, yes, you know, hearing both versions, yes, they liked the second one, but they still needed access to the first more traditional way of describing it because they thought that from the second version alone, they didn't actually have enough to give them uh, to, to create the accurate pictures in their mind. So again, everybody's different and it really uh, highlighted the need for, or the preference that I would have for giving different options. Um, and then I'll just move on to the last. So the last thing I did Obviously, you know, I left a lot of uh, strategies that I had thought of on the table. So, you know, a good example is binaural or directional sound. I'd love to use that in the work, but uh, I wanted to be selective about the strategies that I was using for each film and not use everything at once, but really sort of be able to see, you know, choosing a few strategies, what what worked and what didn't um, or or how something could work and really investigate one strategy fully without sort of throwing in the whole kitchen sink. So I did leave a lot of those on the on the table. Uh, what I did finally was I created a short film, which is called Pessoa. And I created a narrative because I wanted to sort of blend, uh, you know, I like narrative film. I like creating narrative stories. And I also like the abstract uh, work. So what I did was I created a script about an audio describer and it was played, you might know him, Michael Skellern, uh, who's an audio describer who I met through uh, the Vocalize workshops. Um, he's in the story, he's an audio describer who gets tasked to audio describe an abstract film. And he brings on an advisor who's blind, who's played by Margot Cargill, who's an actor and she's been in a lot of my films. Uh, so she plays it, somebody who's consulting. He brings on as a consultant and he creates three different versions of the audio description for this short film. And you see the three different versions in the film. And she keeps on pushing him to be more and more experimental in the film. And he's kind of a shy type and she really gets him out of his comfort zone. So uh, if you get in contact with me, I'm happy. That's a 26 minute film. We're not going to I'm not going to share it here. I'm going to show you the trailer for it, which gives you a little bit of the idea of of uh, the what the film is trying to do. Um, I'm sending it around to festivals. It just won an award, which I'm really proud of at there's a Uvati uh, sees the film disability film festival in Serbia Novi Sad film and I sent it there and they accepted it and I got the award it won the award for the best uh, most successful demystification so I never had heard of that kind of award before but I was thrilled because the jury in their in their uh citation of it they said that I had really with the film really demystified the uh pro the audio description uh process and the audio you know audio description I demystified it for an audience so I was thrilled with that uh I'll take that but I'm just going to show you the uh trailer for the film and you might recognize some people in it sure. zoom Zoom conversation, Violet Verso and Robert Whiston. Like I said, this is unlike anything I've described before, and I'm completely out of my comfort zone. I'm looking forward to it. Double exposure. The arms and hands of an unseen person rummage through kitchen pantry cupboards, seen as though from that person's point of view. This is juxtaposed over a black and white image of a mustachioed man with wire glasses and a fedora, shirt and tie. As he sits paused in his writing, holding a pen over a notebook beside a hardbound copy of Leaves of Grass. You need to get into the mood. I'm not sure what this film is communicating, but you need to figure out what it's about and then express that in your description. Wouldn't that be an interpretation? 
yes, I know you're not supposed to give your interpretation, but this film needs something. Is this the 12,000th time you've scrubbed the coffee pot? Or the 12 millionth? Who's counting? I'm scrubbing my way to ecstasy. Pages and pages of my in and neuroses. What's it called again? Pessoa. Does that mean something? White letters on a black screen. Pessoa. So, oops. I think that some of the some of, it's a film that audio describers will appreciate most of all, um, and then it sh just sort of shows his three different approaches to this weird little film within a film that he's describing, and by the end of it, even though he's kind of a uh, uh, what would you call him inhibited personality, by the end of it he goes quite out of his, uh, his comfort zone in the way that he describes it, using again, in, in the film, he enhances the sound of the film within a film, and but also his delivery and his choice of words and his language that he uses to describe the film becomes much more far-fetched and outrageous. I'm going to put my, I mean, I'm happy to share that with anybody. If you want to see the whole film, just you can contact me by email and uh well maybe i can it's got a password so hang on maybe i'll i can put that in the thing or just email me um so that was the uh you know that was as much uh as much as i had time to do uh in the project in the dycp grant and uh to create that uh, film at the end of it um, we were still in lockdown, so a lot of the film was shot over, uh, over Zoom, uh, so it's a Zoom film. But again, I sort of, <clears throat> although there were only a few techniques that I experimented with in that final film, I thought it, you know, I do think I, or I was hoping to demystify the audio description process. And within that, you can see that audio description, although it seems objective, uh, whether you're a, you know, an informed user or not, that there's options and choices. And even when it feels subjective, we're always making, and I can see Anne nodding her head because I know she subscribes to this philosophy. We're always making choices as audio describers and there's no, you know, there's no objectivity. We're always subjective in what we choose to describe, uh, how we describe uh, and what our, um, uh, the, you know, what our voices are are conveying, even sometimes unconsciously or consciously. Um, so that was the project. That was the work that I did. I hope that, uh, you know, just curious if anybody has any final questions or feedback. Um, I, you know, I'd be really keen to hear how you you think that some of these strategies might, how you might bring them into your own practice, or if it's given you any ideas or any projects that you're working on that you think some of this could apply to, or if you have ideas even outside of, you know, additional to what I've mentioned here, because the, you know, the, it's only, it, it's only limited by our imaginations. Alice, did you have a comment? Sorry. Yes. Um, yeah, I was really, really intrigued, really fascinated with the work you've done. It's it's brilliant. I love hearing about different things that people are doing with audio description. And it put me to mind because recently I was at a very interesting Leeds Playhouse event where they were talking about access, integrating access, etc. And um, I sort of presented those ideas back into Opera North just this morning. And I was saying to them how vital it was that you think of aspects, um, every aspect of design. So in their Macbeth, they used the sound design to make a very clear um, region so that someone who was visually impaired could could work out where which space are we in. So the sound design was used for that. Even a character who always carried keys. So when you hear the jingling of keys, you knew that they were on the stage. Um, so, yeah, it's just fascinating uh, how much we can do. We've all got the technology. And you've just made me think of, of using panning very simple to do. I'm a sound engineer. I know how to do these things, but I've been trialing pre-recording bits of audio description and I've suddenly realised how simple it would be to, to pan people right and left if that's where they're placed on the stage. Um, 
uh, but yeah, there's so much more to do. You just kind of like make my head headspace. Yeah. Piece. So thank you. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. I'm glad that you're thinking of those applications. And I, you know, as audio describers, I think that we always encounter, you encounter some people who are really resistant, but then you might encounter some people and, you know, it becomes something that you tack on at the end or you're doing in isolation. But uh, often you find somebody who's working on the sound, who's just really excited about the possibilities. And that sounds brilliant. I, I love that idea, what they did of creating the spaces with the audio design. And it's just, you can imagine how much some how much more somebody would engage with with the production it, it, with, it, with a sound design like that yeah. and even i think you know this is the point we're always making sighted viewers as well would just be connected to it more viscerally if the sound design has some direction often on stage i mean often on stage something is mic'd but it's mic'd and it comes through general speakers and you don't really get a sense of where the person is on stage and uh, providing the direction is so powerful for sighted and non-sighted viewers. Uh, just to come back on that, the Macbeth got extremely good reviews and lots of people are attributing that to the thought and the care and attention that they made to make it accessible because it made the storytelling clear for everybody. So we didn't know as, as someone with no access needs, I didn't know how much care had gone into that, but it made it really clear, really simple to follow. And yeah, it always translates to everyone enjoying it more. Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. Thank you. Jane has a question. Jane. Hi. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I, I love everything you've shown. It's been all, each film's been interesting in a different way. Um, just going back to the, the sung film, I've forgotten what it's called, the, the, the one with the singing, uh, which I thought was very brave and, and brilliant and creative. Um, and as people have said already, it sort of uh, kind of allows you to um, take on more meaning, more layers of meaning than, than a spoken voice could, because we could take on more complexity. Um, and I, I liked that um, you'd make, it was the singing, but it was also things like the fact that you personalized the dog's scene and made it I. Um, uh, I kind of felt like you were giving a, a, a different experience hourly to, to the, the, the dis, uh, I suppose what I'm trying to, I'm thinking, I'm interested because you said you've had a lot of um, users like watching and giving you feedback. Um, and I, I really like the fact that it's not an exact sort of copy or um, description of the visual film. It's kind of giving an equivalent hourly experience of the film, um, which I thought was was great. But I was wondering, interested what your your users thought of that, you know, or that idea that it might not be totally describing what they or the sighted person next to them has seen, but but did they feel they got the same amount or more or something different? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, like I said, I, I mean, it was really varied the response I got and some people uh, I think there was nobody who said I don't like the singing of it, but the variation that I got from responses was whether people were satisfied with that or some people were and they said that's fine I, I'm not I don't need to bother with the any other description and then other people said no I wouldn't want to only rely on that I I would like to hear also the objective description so that was the big variation in it and I think a lot of that is personal choice really so you know every user is different and I couldn't really say this was because I don't know this person has a musical background and this person doesn't or something like that I just okay. think it's personal choice yeah. so but uh yeah I, I like that you brought up also about how it allowed the personal voice in the description too because I felt that you know going back to it uh it not only uh, made me think of how to describe this for a non-sighted audience. It really made me re-examine what I was, what the film is meant, what I meant by the film and what I wanted to get across. And for me, like I said, I think when bringing in that personal, uh, personal relationship to the dog, I went out and I threw the ball and all that. I think it brings me, it's a very personal film, but I think it feels more personal with that, with my voice and with the, the enhanced audio description than it ever did 
uh, as an abstract experimental film. So that was really interesting in making me think about my filmmaking process. Okay. We'll take Thanks. a quick question from Olga. Olga? Thank you. Um, my question is um, echoing the previous question about uh, AD audience and uh, your viewers, by the, the feedback uh, you had. Um, I was just wondering, because my project is, uh, I will be looking at my project in uh, uh, using technology to personalize uh, audio description and uh, try and give uh, people this choice of the versions. Um, so I was wondering if um, uh, your feed, with the feedback you have, it's available anywhere in the public domain to reference, uh, or would you be able to share some, some of this? Is this something you could, could share? Uh, yeah, thanks, Olga, and I'm really interested in hearing where you go with your project. Um, I, I, I collated a lot of the research and the response on a, a, a website, so if you go into the blogs on that, that has more information about feedback, but if you want to drop me a line, I'll also look, I mean, I, it's all, some of it might be in just in note form, but I'll try and see if I can pull some some more of that together if you're interested, if you just uh, get in contact with me. But there is, I go into more detail on, on this uh, AD website in, there's a few blogs on there and I go into more detail about how uh, uh, some of the responses that I got, got back and the feedback. Can I, um, can I just ask a quick question, Michael, about the collaborative process? Do you feel that when you have somebody who is collaborating with you on a project like a sound designer she feel that enhances the project because that gives you another voice it gives you another perspective yes for sure i think it does and whether that's sort of somebody who's in you know, whether that's somebody involved in the artistic process, like the director of a show or the director of a film or or a sound designer, or whether it's just feedback from users, uh, which you might do at a later stage, but certainly in the creation stage, I, it's, you know, if you're not the creator or if you, if you are the creator to have collaborators, I think it, I never would have come up with, uh, for both of these short films, I never would have come up with the tactics and the that the sound designer helped me. He challenged me a lot and said, you know, this soundtrack, can we can we just get rid of some of the soundtrack and really made me feel more experimental and less precious about a lot of it. So that was really helpful. And in I guess in a case where you don't have that luxury of working with a sound designer, I think it's kind of great to go back to the creators, let's say the director of a film, if you have that access and say, you know, what do you think about this idea or how do you if you could have if you could have really enhanced your sound a sound uh design where would you have gone with it it's a, a great resource and sometimes it's just about asking really like i say some some people some people get really enthusiastic about it and other people are not as much and it's almost time to finish up but are there any final questions or short comments Anybody like to make? Well, I will sum it up by saying a very big thank you to Michael um, for hosting this session and sharing all of his amazing ideas. Um, and I'm sure that everybody here um, will give you uh, a big thank you um, for um, enlightening us and sort of giving us quite a lot to think about. Um, you have Michael's email in the chat. So if you have any further questions afterwards, then please do drop him an email um, and sort of carry on the conversation afterwards. And I'd like to thank everybody for participating in this session. Yes, I, I reiterate that. Thank you all for being here. It's really exciting because I know, you know, I've shared this with people, but to share it with practitioners is really exciting and 
with an informed audience. So that I can't find the link for the full film, but I'm happy of Pessoa, but I'm really happy to share it with you. So drop me a line if you want to see that. I'm really happy. I'd be really happy for you to uh, do that. And thank you, Tim, and to the association for providing this place to share this work. Yeah, that, that excellent. And we have recorded it, so I'll be sending a link out in the next few days um, for YouTube links. So um, everybody will be able to sort of revisit it who's been in the session today, but also all the people who couldn't attend as well. And we'll send some um, emails out in the next month or two about future sessions. And thank you for everyone who's been involved in the session today thanks a lot okay bye see, see you again bye, thank everyone. You. bye everyone